Welcome to The Code of Life, I'm Randine Neal. Back in 2016, a, a tragedy hit the Vancouver Aquarium that rocked the staff, the city, and the entire province. The death of two of its beloved belugas, Aurora and her daughter Keela, just nine days apart. As scientists searched for the cause of their deaths, they turned to genomics to help, and that tragedy did spark hope. The answers they found became groundbreaking research that will not only help belugas in the future, but several other animal species as well. And genomics is leading the way to help scientists at the Vancouver Aquarium and several other organizations as well. Dr. Martin Helena is the chief vet at the Vancouver Aquarium. He joins us now to talk more about this. Dr. Marty, I hear they call you. Yeah, or, or they call me all sorts of things, I guess. Oh, yeah. do they? Do you prefer Dr. Marty? <laughs> uh, just Marty's. Okay. Um, I know this is tough for you because I know that you're absolutely, absolutely yeah. shattered by this. But can you go back and just tell us the story of Aurora and Keela and how they even came to be at the aquarium in the first place? Sure. Um, I joined the aquarium in 2006. Um uh, at that point in time, Aurora had been there for quite some time, and and Keela had now been kind of growing up and was, I believe, about twelve years old. Um, and so, again, you know, quickly formed a bond with them. They're, you know, absolutely spectacular uh, animals, as so many animals are, and they're very special in their own way. Um, Keela was the first beluga whale that was ever born at an institution or an aquarium in in, in Canada. Um, so she was quite special. I think she was. Uh, even the uh, the inspiration for Rafi's baby beluga song, so you know, quite quite well known. Both of these animals, um, of course, the aquarium is such a centerpiece for for the city and and people growing up with these whales. So in um, <clears throat> you know in 2016, um, uh, when uh, Keela was reported to be off, I think it was on a uh, you know a Sunday, um, and then not eating the next day um, and then a procedure scheduled for the next day um, she died that morning you know very very acutely very suddenly um, and without a whole lot of clinical signs and then most scary enough Aurora started showing the same clinical signs within about a day or two of Keela so um, you know we sort of rushed in and and, and spent a, a lot of time trying to diagnose um, Aurora um, very nonspecific signs or gastrointestinal upset, um, you know, ran diagnostics like crazy when, when she was alive, actually thought we'd turn her around for a little bit. And then, and then she finally passed away um, of a, a, an aortic aneurysm. Um, and so I don't even know whether we could have actually turned her around and then, and then she had an aneurysm or whether it was all related. Um, but, um, you know, as you say, absolutely devastating. You know, I still think to this day, um, um, you know, one of the worst situations I've ever been in. Um, those nine days where we were working really hard with Aurora, obviously the community knew tremendous support from the community, lots of people who'd known these animals almost their entire lives um, involved in, in the process, you know, very closely. So um, when Aurora passed as well, obviously we were quite devastated and, and then the mission turned to, you know, why? Um, and we, we just didn't have a smoking gun. Um, I want to say we spent close to $150,000 plus untold in-kind, um, you know, volunteer type of diagnostics as well, run by everyone, you know, samples run in triplicate or quadruplicate, sent to veterinary schools uh, throughout North America, um, certainly all of our local authorities as well. Human hospitals, Vancouver General Hospital came, came to us and, and their pathologists had a look at everything and no one could find a smoking gun. And then um, sort of a collaborative genomic project, um, UBC, as well as BC Cancer, um, and then Genome BC, of course, uh, kind of called us and, and said, you know, have you, have you done some, some molecular stuff, genomics? And of course, we'd, we'd done, you know, the PCRs and, and uh, sort of the targeted molecular diagnostics. Um, also um, used the University of Florida laboratory, Dr. Jim Wellahan and Tom Waltzik, who are our big genome guys there. Um, so samples have been sent there. Um, but, you know, no, you know, we, we hadn't run, you know, this sort of mass genomic kind of thing looking for any kind of pathogen. So, so this group of people um, headed by Dr. Stephen uh, Jones at BC Cancer really kind of took this project in and, um, and went gangbusters with it, you know, and sequenced all sorts of tissue looking for anything and everything. And, you know, we, we had, uh, you know, one little green light 
at one point, think, you know, a virus related to bovine leukosis virus, but unfortunately that was just part of the, uh, it was a contam reagent contaminant, so it, it didn't lead to anything. Um, but, you know, not, nothing, no significant pathogen at all in a, in a large variety of tissues, which is on its own kind of bizarro. Um, but I guess the, the silver lining to all that was that um, the group had processed so much tissue, had done so much sequencing, that they, you know, called and said, "Look, um, I think we've sequenced the entire beluga genome. Um, is that worth something?" And I went, well, "Yeah, I mean, that's that's incredible." First of all, I was, you know, I'm still a you know kid of the '80s and '90s, so I thought it took 14 years to get a genome right. <laughs> I mean, I still remember the cover of Time magazine, G Human Genome Sequence, 14 years later. Um, so I was like, "What?" Uh, you know, I had no idea. And, and and you know, the sequencing is so incredible now. And and Stephen Jones is and his team is. I mean, those guys are incredible. When you know later, when other universities and, and institutions had them, University of Illinois, for example, or Northwestern, I can't remember which, call up and their genomics team went. Um, you know, we'd love to help. You know, have you looked at that? And said, "Yeah, we're we're working with this guy, Stephen Jones." They went, "Yeah, you got it covered." You know. <laughs> <laughs> you're good um so i was like yeah i think we're good um so anyway yeah no, the genome came out of it which was kind of the silver lining to that publication of course and and kind of the legacy of of keel and aurora, uh, aurora preserved forever i guess and just to finish their story no cause really was ever found for no I, I mean i think um you know in the end based on just ruling everything else out yeah. uh, we're left with with some kind of toxic insult um, so some toxin that, that either was introduced and cleared by the animals, whether, um, you know, coming from the water, um, that were, it was brought into the institution, um, something that was given to them maliciously, um, or something that, you know, our own treat, water treatment, um, process inadvertently released. So, and unfortunately, no, we still don't know. So as you said, out of that tragedy, for the first time ever, a beluga was completely genomically sequenced. Like my, uh, yeah, and I, my impression is like really, really well. You know, as Stephen says, this is one of the most complete genomes that's ever been published. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And what type of information will that give scientists in the future? Well, I mean, you can just think of what's happened based on the human genome being published, whether it's um, looking at genetic diseases and prevention of genetic diseases, whether it's looking at populations of humans from one area of the, of the world that are susceptible to something compared to other um, populations. That's very important for Beluga, where we've got um, several isolated populations, particularly in the Cook Inlet in Alaska and, and then right here at home. And, in Canada, um, in the St. Lawrence, that's a you know an isolated population. Both those are, are highly endangered. You know why are they endangered compared to healthy populations in, in Hudson's Bay? Knowing the genome helps a lot with that. Um, for example, the St. Lawrence population is quite prone to cancer. Um, is that just because they're exposed to something? Is it a completely genetic thing because there's they've been you know such a small population for so long? Um, what is it? The genome obviously helps with that. Um, the, there's a, a, a person from, um, from the uh, northeastern U.S., oh my gosh, he's a very famous human dentist, Martin's his first name, I can remember that one. Um, anyway, he looks a lot at Norwal and works at, looks at Norwal tusk, and um, the monodontidae, there's only two genuses, or sorry, only two species in, in that group, and that's Norwal and Beluga, so it's, you know, there's as closely, you know, related in, in that group as possible. So. Um, he sequenced Norwal, we sequenced Beluga, and he can figure out, um, you know, which set of genes makes teeth suddenly go crazy, right? And and that's that's absolutely unbelievable. So all this sort of ecological, health-based, population-based, um, conservation Even medicine. Even environmental-based, right? Looking at water. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, and that's a whole other, I mean, that, yeah, we can get on to where genomics is going and how sequencing is fast and patient-side sequencing and all that kind of stuff, which is taking this stuff to cloud nine, that's unbelievable. That collaboration with um, Dr. Stephen Jones right. from the BC Cancer Agency went even further after he sequenced um, a beluga. You said that several other species were sequenced after that. Yeah, I mean, this has led now to um, uh, you know a four or five year collaboration on any number of different projects. Uh, one of his graduate students or, or fellows, postdocs, uh, Dr. Samantha Jones, not related, I think, 
um, Welsh, obviously. <laughs> but um, yeah, she helped us out with some cancer in sea otters. So in that process, we um, published on the sea otter genome um, and then looked at lymphoma. And the you know, interesting results there is, is sea otter lymphoma genetically, as far as the genes that are involved in it are triggered and turned on, is much closely, much more closely related to human lymphoma than to dog lymphoma, for example. And we were treating this animal like a dog lymphoma because that's our case study, right? And they were like, mm, it's actually you know, a little bit more human related. So that's kind of cool. And uh, yeah, we've sequenced now harbor seal, wolf seal, stellar sea lion, several species, the, the cancer stuff. Um, yeah, you know, um, in our world, looking at environmental um, conditions, water quality has applications in space travel. Uh, so folks are really interested in Mars habitats and what does water look like and what's healthy, what's bad water, what's normal microbiome. And then so they look at, you know, aquarium comparisons and long-term recycling of a closed aquariums versus our open aquarium yeah. and what's the microbiome of those systems. Um, and so, you know, you can sequence out every organism and look at metagenomics now, right? Looking at you know, the distribution of organisms across a, an environment and what organisms rise and fall when environmental factors change, which, which is awesome. And that went, oh my gosh, don't get me started, but that went down the big sea star mortality event that we were involved oh, with over the last right, few yeah. years. Um, Did we, genomics help solve that? Yeah. Um, so we worked with um, Dr. Ian Houston out of the University of Cornell, primarily, um, who's also a, a genome guy. And he was looking at um, the, the surface environment of sea stars and, and, and sea stars that were dying and sea stars that were healthy and noticed that um, all of a sudden these anaerobic populations of particularly bacteria just kind of skyrocketed in the animals as they were dying just before they died. So, you know, we think a lot of this has been an environmental uh, change, so ocean hypoxia essentially, so warming water, lower oxygen, and that was a trigger event. Um, there was a virus that was associated, probably not the causative agent, but there was a, a parvovirus that was uh, associated with the mortality as well. So, yeah, as part of our big sea star die-off genomics, we came into that as well. And I know that um, you didn't um, sequence uh, the killer whale, but um, you've used genomics to help solve some issues for the resident killer whales. Right. As well. So now we're get, get, you know getting into that metagenomics kind of stuff, the microbiome stuff, and and working with folks um, that are are trying to um, preserve our local um, endangered species of killer whale, the southern resident um, killer whales. Um, JK and L pod, you know, everyone local knows them. Um, they know them better than I do, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I introduced that to that group. Again, I'm, I'm more of a clinical veterinarian, a primary clinician, so I get involved on, on usually an individual animal or a disease outbreak investigation kind of thing. Um, but we were called in to, to help with J50, a, a juvenile killer whale that was obviously sick. And looking at treatment options and 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 uh, you know future discussions on how do we monitor a sick killer whale, um, what um, um, what uh, sorts of things can we do remotely? And so the genomics comes right back. So we're looking at respiratory tract um, genomics. You know what are normal organisms? How did organism change in a sick whale or a starving whale? And comparing also uh, on the digestive tract because we can get blowhole samples and we can get fecal samples without really disturbing a whale. Um, so that stuff is, yeah, very interesting. It's fascinating. I know that we're in a time of COVID, Dr. Marty, and that the aquarium is closed right now. Okay. I, I hear that it's going to open soon, but how is how is everyone doing there? How are all the animals doing? Yeah, I think um, the animals are doing just fine. Um, you, you know, as, as far as they are concerned, it's, it's operations as, as normal. You know, we're certainly... Um, back to doing all of our, we kind of postponed uh, routine physicals and vaccinations and stuff for a couple of months just to see where we're going and how long this would last. Although they did get tested for COVID. They did a couple, yeah. Which yeah. animals? So we tested um, the animals that, that people work with most closely, the, the, the mammals that people work with most closely. So stellar sea lion, fur seal, sea otter, and harbor seal for, for COVID. Now we haven't gotten results back yet. They had to go to a special sort of veterinary route of things, which takes a little bit longer. So they had to cross the border. And of course, border closures had a little something to do with that. But they're at the University of California, Davis for, for testing. But they're all fine so far. Uh, yeah, no one's shown any clinical signs of COVID yet. No, not as far as the animals are concerned. Yeah. Um, and I know that you had to put out a bit of a fundraising push, not you personally, but the aquarium sure. in general, because a lot of your funding comes through ticket sales, right? And that has just completely disappeared. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. You know, and just, just like um, Science World or CAP Suspension Bridge or, or whatever, we are visitor driven. I mean, that's our whole, um, it's not really business as it's a nonprofit, 
but its model is it's it's funded by ticket sales people visiting so um yeah we're we're very much in trouble like a lot of zoos and aquariums across north america and all across the world really um and yeah quite frankly in a lot of trouble but there is talk of reopening, at finding a way, social, physical distancing. Yeah, properly. yeah, a lot of folks involved with that. Um, I've got a, like a little peripheral role to sort of maximizing um, uh, protection to the animals and, and also minimizing cross-contamination if, if animals do somehow become a, a vector for COVID. Um, so yeah, looking at one-way traffic flows and, and, and opening up in a limited capacity and, and hoping for early mid-June for at least a trial opening. Um, so yeah, I think everyone's kind of excited about that. It'll Absolutely. be a new experience, but it, um, it might be a kind of a cooler, more intimate experience for visitors as well. So we'll, we'll see how it all works out. Final question I asked you earlier, but not on tape. Have <laughs> the animals noticed a difference, mm -hmm. all 65,000 of them, that there's no more people <laughs> wandering around? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, um, you, you know, the folks that work with them primarily are, are you know, trainers or biologists or husbandry staff, however they want to be referred to. Um, you know, they're so good and they've taken upon themselves to keep things very interesting and fun. Um, so we definitely have animals wandering around places that we wouldn't normally, you know. Um, so the penguins like to do a daily stroll around the aquarium and stuff. So I think actually um, for, for some of the animals, it, it's just sort of fun and different. I think for a lot of animals, the, they don't really notice, you know, as far as things that they're current, really concerned about, food, interaction, um, being happy, light and cycles and all, all that is, is always systems, all systems go and, and as normal as possible. So I think most animals aren't noticing. A, a few are getting a little extra attention, I suppose. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for giving us this update oh, yeah, and no um, turning what was a tragedy into something that was really worthwhile for not only the aquarium, but the entire world. Oh, well, thank you very much. This uh, has been great. Thank you.